Okay, welcome to uh, our next class of uh, understanding marriage. Um, in our last class, we did look at uh, uh, how uh, we did uh, see how how God is the designer of marriage. We were looking at some perspectives of marriage. Um, we looked at marriage being a good thing, right? We, we're going to continue on, but before that, I think I have a question that somebody. Uh, has raised. I think Christopher, did you did you raise a hand to ask a question? Christopher, yes, yes, yes. Um, yes. yes. Go ahead. The question I had was with regards to the uh, you know with marriage uh, or rather through marriage, uh, the, the husband and wife becoming one person, mm -hmm. and um, I, I just wanted to understand. Um, you know, in from point of view of uh, you know, uh, I mean, in in during uh, uh, you know, in, in the judgment day, uh, would that be uh, would that be considered um, uh, you know something that would need to be you know uh, judged by God? And um, um, this this one person, I just want want to understand you know how this sort of you know fits in with uh, you know the individual you know the individual characteristics of you know, the, the husband and the wife and then you know uh, uh, you know and also you know just being represented as as one person and then being judged as either husband wife or uh, or as a, as a as a couple as a, as a as that one person so if mm -hmm. you could just uh, provide a more de detail on that Okay, so this is something that comes in as another perspective that we are going to be looking into. So maybe when we reach there, uh, Christopher, if you have a further question, then I can take it on from there. What does it mean to be one person? What does it look like when, when there are um, uh, individual differences in it? That's one part of your question. The second part of your question was, how does it um, play out during Judgment Day? Would you be judged for the fact of... Um, uh, not displaying that oneness in the relationship right now. So uh, maybe I'll be able to answer part of it. Uh, the part, the the next part is something uh, you know uh, we 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 can open up. Um, so I will come to that. Uh, I hope that's okay, Christopher. As we as we go into the next point, it is it is there um, as part of the uh, the class. Okay. Um, so I will come back to your question. So um, going back on on the perspectives of uh, 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 you know what what scripture talks about the the next thing that the Bible talks about is that marriage is an institution that needs to be honored. So when we look at uh, um, the verse uh, in Hebrews uh, chapter thirteen verse four, which I'll just like to read to you Hebrews thirteen four. It says, "Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another." in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. So when when God did see marriage, the way that God saw marriage was with the reverence. There was honor in, in what he created. So when we're looking at anything that happens within marriage, especially that of sexual intimacy, it is something that God desires to be guarded and um, uh, kept sacred with the purity that He intended it um, in that intended to to for it to have. So the intimacy that is there. So when we're looking at um, honoring marriage, the intimacy that is there is intended between the people within uh, the marriage, and it is it is that intimacy that becomes an expression to that oneness okay so when when as people who honor god or who believe in god would also want to honor his word and honor uh, anything that he has uh, put in put in place so uh, so that so as a result, we, uh, you know, we are need we are mindful of the fact that this is an institution ordained by God, and not something that's a social institution. Institution that if it doesn't work, uh, you know, you have out of it, or if you don't have the intimacy that it requires, you find it outside. Because God instituted it with a reverence, and um, as His children, we are to keep. Um, that purity and that sacredness that's there within marriage. So marriage is an institution that needs to be honored. Going on, marriage is a promise. It is a solemn 
covenant. It is, it is a promise that you see. Um, now, how is this established? This is established through um, your vows, you know, so uh, if, uh, you know, depending on the, the, the maybe the, the church that you've, uh, you know, got married in, there have been vows that you exchanged with one another, and, and this could have taken many forms. Uh, you know, here at APC, vows are said to one another, but, you know, in, in the traditional church where I got married, um, the, um, uh, the, the clergy was the one who, you know, spoke the vows, and we just had to say, okay, yes, I agree, right? But nonetheless, it is, um, uh, it is a vow that you speak before God. So when we're looking at it as a solemn promise or a solemn covenant, you are saying that uh, no matter what, I, I walk in this alongside with you. And uh, it, is, it, is that, it is with that step of faith that you make that promise, that you make that covenant. Um, and God is there as a witness in, in that uh, covenant-making uh, relationship or covenant-making decree that you give. So uh, we see, again, uh, if, if you look at this in uh, the, the verse that is pointed out here is in Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, OK? Uh, so if at um, the second verse, uh, I mean, the thirteenth verse, God saying, um, you know, He's saying, you don't get what you want from God because because of your because of the way that you're you're living your life. And then He says, because uh, you know, do you know why? And He says, it's simple because God was there as a witness when you spoke your marriage vows to your bride, and now you've broken those those vows so that's the way that god has established this it is it is a relationship that is built on a covenant that's built on a prom promise that is there um, in the presence of the lord okay the next thing that it talks about is marriages between one man and one woman only so uh, as we highlight this in the, verse, uh, in the um, uh, sections below where we spoke about the definition of marriage where we found genesis 2 24 to 25 it talks of how man leaves his his father and mother and cleave so he needs to leave to cleave so this is so we the, it doesn't just say that it's the man who leaves and not the woman it is intended to know that both the man and the woman leave every responsibility or other earthly relationship and joins in with with the husband so and this um, and when we when we're talking about this being between one man and one woman only the initial responsibility of a person who is stepping into um, this sacred intimacy is to um, establish independence from significant people in his or her life which would mean parents which would mean siblings uh, any 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 other relationships that you have invested in emotionally you have invested in uh, in other other significant ways to be able to cut off to be able to leave so that you have um, a better place to, you have a place in marriage where you can attach now uh, when when we say that you know this this um, relationship between man and woman can be seen as like a core you know like like a like a inner circle and uh, in order for the inner circle to be tight you need to be careful not to um uh, uh, not to bring in the influences of others. So that uh, the the inner circle is meant for just this one man and this this one woman. And uh, you would see that there is uh, there is no space or um, uh, or or an openness or a room for anybody else to enter in. Why? Because if there was a crowding, if there were uh, uh, influences that get into the marriage, it is definitely going to have some form of attention or there is there can be stress or there can be discord that happens. So when a marriage gets crowded, um, uh, uh, you know, the 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 people within the partners within the marriage uh, ex experience difficulty and how do we see this out we see this uh, in the emotional dependence that either one of the partners may have on significant others 
um, in their families or among their friends or it could be because of certain attachments or certain inappropriate friendships or past uh, relationships um, that enter into this into this inner sanctum and as as a result the partner does not hold that um, uh, that that same importance that that uh, is required for them. So being careful that uh, that the husband and the wife has a healthy um, dependence on each other and uh, and a healthy detachment from those uh, outside. Now this often comes as um, uh, you know, especially when I am when. I work uh, among people, um, a lot of people who I work with may not be believers. And this comes in, especially in the culture that, that uh, I live in, it comes in as a difficult um, instruction. You know, the fear, because, um, you know, in, in India, a lot of times parents are seen as next to gods, especially mothers are seen as next to gods. You know, my mother is next to God. And I cannot leave my mother in order to attach to you. So this kind of um, uh, learning or an understanding becomes very difficult for people to accept. Yet, we need to understand this does not mean that that you do not care for your significant family or your parents or your siblings or those who may be elderly. It doesn't mean that. It means that your attachment should be uh, should be um, primarily focused to your to your spouse. And decisions and emotional uh, interactions happens first there, and then only um, you know to those outside. So you know, as we go in through the course, we will be talking about a lot, lot uh, of this also. So, uh, I, I, and even as we are saying this, um, I know there aren't any grandparents in this. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There are a few parents who who have adult children, but I don't think anyone is married yet. You know, your own children aren't married yet. But in time, I think this is something that you need to know as a parent to be able to give space and be able to give uh, to let help your son or your daughter let uh, to 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 release them uh, when they are ready for marriage or when they are preparing for marriage, so that they can give their spouse that attention and every everything that they need to build a unit and a family together okay um, and as we're talking about about God's principle of marriage being what between one man and one woman uh, uh, especially in the society at the time that we are living in like I said marriage has been distorted very very um, significantly where you are seeing more same-sex marriages um, marriages um, you know homosexual relationships and god's word okay uh, is very very um uh, strong on that uh, if you look at romans 1 chapter 1 verses 26 and 28 he says that god's word teaches us that that um, homosexuality is something that he detests it's an abomination okay and um, uh, when when um when we read that verse, what we need to see is, yes, the world approves of this kind of a marriage. But God's word is is very instructive about the fact that this is not his way. This is not uh, his desire for marriage. So even when we hate the sin that people may be in, we continue to love the person. Okay, so there are going to be times people are going to come to you. Okay, we do not shun them and throw them away because they are le leading sinful lives. We hate the sin but love the person and reach them out in love and get and help them to restore their lives back to the way that God desired it to be. Okay, so marriage is between one man and one woman only okay um, I'm moving to the next point I will wait I will probably take questions uh, maybe after the next uh, the next point uh, and also address what Christopher had asked um, the next thing we see is the marriage is a union of two we see this 
um, you know, in scripture, where uh, apart from what the verse that we spoke about in Ephesians chapter 5, 31 to 32, uh, um, you know, Paul talks about this and, and he quotes what Jesus said and he says, there is a deep secret truth revealed in this scripture, which I understand as applying to Christ and the church. So what Paul is doing here, he's making an analogy. He's, make, he's drawing a, something like a parallel. And he says, um, you know, just like the husband and the wife join together or live together or build a relationship together, the same, sorry, the same way that Christ responds to the church and chi church responds to Christ is the way that a husband should respond to the wife and the wife responds to the, to the, to the, to the husband. So he is talking about this meaning of one flesh. What does it mean to be one flesh? He's saying it's similar to the way that Christ uh, has come down to save his church. So this meaning of one flesh, so we take, um, uh, you know, we, we uh, take an inference through what Paul is saying and saying this one flesh is, is being this one united person. So if, um, if it is two people who are coming together, it's, it's like there is just one person. And we see this uh, in the way that the comparison that Paul makes in this, where he where he talks about that how the how Christ and the church is united, okay? How um, we are Christ, we belong to Christ, okay? Uh, to the point where that we are in Him, just like as He is in us, we do and we walk like the way that He did, uh, the way that He walked. Um, we uh, live. We live in this world um, as Christ ambassadors. Okay, so uh, he, uh, Jesus, talks about this and says, you know, just like how I abide in you, you know, you abide in me. So it's that kind of a perfect union that that God is talking about, being that one in spirit, being united in one person, just as you are being united in the body as well as the soul. So uh, just as just as being one in spirit, just as being one in body and one in soul is the way that we be being one in spirit. Now, what does this practically mean? What? How does this actually work? So it's one thing to know of it and it's one thing to live it in the everyday life. So like, like Christopher did point out, so understanding it, knowing it is one, but when you have two different people in the marriage, two different personalities in the marriage, it doesn't become an easy thing. And I'm sure each of us here who have married have gone through those phases, gone through that time when there has been a disagreement, when there hasn't been such a union as is expected when there when there hasn't been complementarity when there hasn't been um, a sense of intimacy right we have all been through that uh, through those phases because of our individual differences that are there so um, now in scripture so so right now we're just we are going to be looking at what does it mean to become one and we will address this uh, uh, a little further so when we're looking at becoming one it is one building a relationship a relationship can be built only if you one spend time spend your uh, uh, you you invest your thoughts your understanding your everything a relationship requires vulnerability, right? So when you are relating to somebody, if if we aren't in a place of vulnerability, we may not be able to build a relationship. Think of your relationship with God, right? Uh, when sometimes we are incongruent in the way that we know in our hearts something should be done and the way that we do it right there is a sense of a detached relationship okay like for example i know i have i shouldn't lie 
but maybe in the next minute I am lying. I immediately am able to pick in the spirit realm that there is a detachment, right? So a relationship is one that requires vulnerability, where you share your thoughts, your ideas, you open up yourself for good communication, be in a place of understanding that my spouse can be different from me. And yet, I want to build that relationship. So it is the need to see that just as much as I would like my thoughts and my views or my opinions to be seen by the other person, I also need to be careful and understanding that they may not see it like I do, which comes to a place of agreement. Right. So when we're looking at agreement, we're saying the ability to consider that there are differing opinions. And even in spite of these different differing opinions, um, you come together because you know that you are aligned together or you're bought together to serve God and his greater purposes. So I think um, maybe... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example in my own life. So when I when when I look at um, you know uh, so before uh, this is this is an example way back. Okay, um, before we joined um, uh, church, APC, we were part of a traditional church, and uh, uh, you know we we were we were not young believers. We were we were strong believers, but we had very little about the knowledge of God's word, um, uh, you know, how, how the power of the Holy Spirit works within us. Um, but at, at our earlier years, um, my husband, um, you know, uh, felt that it was time uh, to, you know, to, to, to leave the tradition, traditional ch church and go after what the Spirit uh, had for us. And I was very, very uncomfortable because this is what I knew right from the time I was young and uh, everything was set, you know, you, you had your community. But to uproot from there into something else was a very, very difficult decision for me to make. Um, but because, I, I believe because of the relationship that was there between um, my husband and me, knowing that I could trust him, that even though he makes a decision like that, and you know that that he is led by God to make that decision, I worked in agreement. It was hard. It was not easy. It was not something that I may have willingly wanted to do, but to know that I considered that there is a differing opinion here, and um, you know, understanding what God had for me, I I said, okay, let me join in along with you. So again, becoming one means again an agreement in spite of knowing that there are these differing views or differing opinions. It also means becoming one is complementing. You know, if you look at a lock in a key, you can never open a lock with any key. It needs a particular key, right? So it is, it's, a, it's, it's a sense of complementing one another, where one may be strong in, the other may be weak in, but you work together in order to... Uh, to, to uh, to live out whatever God has for you. So it, they become perfectly joined or, or, or in other words, um, you know, if you've seen puzzle pieces, even puzzle pieces, unless you get the right, uh, you know, piece, it doesn't join, align itself and work together. So complementing is knowing that I may not be strong in something, somebody else could be, but then, you know, I, I take it as my own because we're one person. So that's, that's again, another um, way that we live out that, um, that oneness. The next is unity, where even the differences that we may have is becomes a reason for us to work in closer unit, uh, closer cooperation with one another. So even even knowing that you know uh, I differ in in certain things um, from my my husband. Yet working uh, in it together is what builds that oneness. And of course, uh, the one is intimacy. Now, intimacy, uh, do not think that intimacy has only sexuality in its, in its picture. It means every kind of closeness. It's like, you know, you looking at yourself in a mirror and seeing the way that you are. That's the way the intimacy is built. Now, even as I say this, um, you know, we may all be a at very, very different places in this entire spectrum 
of this becoming one. But in order to be, uh, in order for us to become uh, sorry. Uh, this is the way that God designed it to be, to become one. And it is the only way that we see that you can become one is when it is achieved um, in his power, in his spirit. We can only achieve it that way. Very often, you know, uh, it, it is found, it is difficult to do it. It is difficult to do it outside of him. So what are some of the things that keep you from becoming one? So I hope this addresses part of your question, uh, Christopher. Um, so some of the things that keep you from becoming one is when uh, there is uh, self-centeredness. OK, you can call it, um, I know we may know it in different words, like ego or being selfish or being, uh, you know, very uh, very me focused right so that one is that that uh, sorry that self-centered individuality when i think you know i want to preserve myself i should be able to um you know get whatever i want um i uh, you know how can my needs not be met and this is something that i see in um uh, people who are uh, you know, in in our in our current world today, that they're saying that you know, when I come into marriage, I don't want to lose myself. I don't want to lose who I am, my individuality. You know, I have certain needs, I have certain desires, and I want to ensure that I preserve it. Whether uh, you know, if if they don't like it or not, I'm the first one to walk away out of it. And the the process of becoming one does not mean that you lose your individuality. In fact, what it's supposed to mean is that you're complementing your individuality with somebody else's so that you can work together as one. But uh, so, so what we're looking at is that perfect, again, like I said, the lock and key, that perfect alignment with one another. But it can often be broken <clears throat> because of that desire to um, to just in, to preserve that inner self, preserve that ego, and often that oneness cannot happen when we we attempt to preserve preserve that. So uh, when when we look at that self centered individuality, that is something that can destroy that oneness and that companionship. <clears throat> sorry, and that companionship. Okay, so again, it, just to reiterate that we do not lose that individuality. It, in fact, it gets enhanced. It gets better. You know, when there are two people on the team, so much more work gets done, right? So for those of us, um, you know, who are in the kitchen, who work, and you have a big meal to prepare, that, uh, you know, four hands are definitely better than just two hands, you know? So uh, we see that, that that is what, what what God desires as oneness. Now, even in the context of this, we also do want to emphasize that when we're looking at oneness, we are also looking at how people are yoked together, equally yoked together. And you know, we see that um, uh, uh, in in uh, Paul talks about it in two Corinthians six. He says, "Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship?" has righteousness with lawless, lawlessness. Okay, this so it also emphasizes when we're looking at oneness, we're also emphasizing that a believer should not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever because oneness can be um, a struggle, can be something that may not, not come in in its entirety as the way that uh, god designed designed it to be because there could be you know when there is an equality in the way people believe, uh, of what they believe in there could be um, you know conflicts about um, parenting there can be conflicts about spending time with each other there can be conflicts about how decisions are made there can be conflicts about values and understanding so um you know so that it is it is with with good stead that god has has spoken and said you know do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever okay i'm just going to stop here for two minutes just to know uh chris whether i addressed it addressed your first question i know i have not addressed your second one you have any anything else for the first question that you had in mind? Uh, 
Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think uh, I think you've addressed most of it. Uh, uh, I, I think the only uh, sort of uh, a point I would make is because I mean this is just uh, I guess it's it's also about reality, uh, as in uh, you know things that take place and you know, people. I mean there are many people who are ex have experienced this, and that is where um, uh, in a sense you know sometimes. Um, Marriages become, uh, you know, uh, you know, keep keep. Uh, uh, sorry, it's a little bit of background song. So marriages continue, um, uh, and and perhaps the, you know they, they they even started you know uh, perhaps sometimes for the wrong reasons. Um, uh, so God may not have been in the mix in, in, in those in those cases. The midst uh, so, of it, you know, a couple of scenarios where you know people have, um, you know, the husbands have gone completely astray, and women they sort of look the other side, or other other you know look the other side and, and accept it in a sense, because they want to maintain that status quo. Um, so I guess where I'm coming from is, it could be possible where, um, you know. People have got. I mean, there are marriages which are, have not were not really, uh, you know, uh, you know, predestined by uh, predestined by God, and uh, because God is not in the mix in the in those cases, and therefore, um, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, this 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 oneness, and you know, being able to, uh, you know. Uh, you know, maintain that um, that uh, in, in that institution of marriage in that in that particular instance. Uh, mm -hmm. Should it should it you know should, you know uh, should it really be uh, you know um, you know either continue or should it you know just continue I mean or just continue the way it has you know it 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 has um, you know gone through in the in the last whatever number of years. Yeah. So, so Paul talks about that uh, in Corinthians, where he says, you know, especially let's say, like you said, when when God is not in the mix, when you are yoked with an unbeliever, uh, and uh, it, uh, you know, Paul describes that, that um, you know, stay with your unbeliever, leaving partner because through you they could be sanctified is one thing that Paul says and he also says um, you know that that you do all that you can to stick on in that uh, in that relationship but if they abandon you know they are free to go um, and uh, so we, again, we will be looking at all of this later so the only two reasons um, that the Bible gives for a separation is adultery and abandonment Okay, and abandonment in the case of when uh, yeah, an unbelieving spouse leaves the believing spouse, right? Uh, so that's something. Uh, so Paul says that if you are in it and uh, you are able to stay in it, continue. Do not, you know, do not do anything because through you, your uh, through you, through you, your partner can be your spouse can be sanctified. So yes, um, I uh, from what Paul says, we stay. We continue to stay and live a life in in what God has um, uh, brought us to. And uh, I think I want to make one point here. Now, even in a very difficult relationship, you and I have the choice of following God even in that relationship. Now that does not mean you're you act foolishly. Like for example, you know, a lot of times these words are very misconstrued. Like let's say you are in a physically violent relationship, you need help. It does not mean that when God has asked you to stay, that you know you continue staying there and keep getting beaten. That's not the point. The point is you need help. You need to separate yourself for some time till you can get help for your partner, right? But what it what what I'm what I'm specifically trying to say is that in let's say in a relationship where there isn't um, where where the emotional uh, intimacy or closeness is not as you expected it to be, or uh, let's say there have been certain challenges in the relationship maybe there have been uh, issues that have gone by maybe there's been adultery or there have been multi relationships um uh, you know 
you are called by God. You've been given a choice and a calling by God to uh, to act in love, to be to be merciful, to be to be forgiving. Not an easy thing to do. Please don't get me wrong when I'm saying this, that it is the most difficult. And I know it because I see couples every day crying out, uh, wanting to do the right thing, but just not having the energy and the and the strength to do it right so all of this the self-centered individuality this oneness can be achieved only by god so uh, only his forgiving spirit in you can help you in that and this is not a, a walk you should be doing on your own you do need help you do need uh, help of godly people to work with you okay so uh, so as I said, what I what I mean to say is, if you have a choice to be to your partner what God wants you to be to them, please go ahead and be and do that with the help and the power of God. Okay, all right. Okay, I'm going on to my last point, and maybe I leave it open for another two three minutes for uh, any any other question. The last one is yes, marriage is a journey till death do us part. Okay, uh, Ma uh, Jesus speaks about that and he says, what God has joined together, let man not separate. And you would have probably heard this on your wedding day when, uh, you know, you were married. Now, marriage is for a lifetime and uh, we what we are called to do is to grow in our marriages till the time one of us are called so we we continue to to know that this is not momentary this is not something that is just for today but this is the i think one of the biggest decisions after salvation that you would make so young men all you young men who want to get married remember that this is a lifetime commitment um, you're going to you, you're going to make, and something that you are putting your right foot forward and saying, "I am in it for the long haul till death do us part." Okay. So, in conclusion, we did talk about what marriage was. We saw how God designed marriage to be. Uh, we looked at perspectives of what God desires marriage to be. He says it's a good thing. It's some. It's a, a institution that needs to be honored. It's a promise that you make. It's the vows that you make in front of God. It is between one man and one woman only. Ho only where you preserve the inner circle of marriage uh, it is a union of two where when you become one you walk in agreement you walk in a relationship you walk in intimacy you walk in unity um, uh, and you you walk in uh, uh, not being self-centered but being able to give of yourself to your spouse and lastly marriage is um, something that is for the for the long term till death do you part Okay, um, I want to open it out briefly for maybe around five minutes of questions and then we could uh, pray, we could commit our marriages and uh, pray that we will see marriage the way that God sees it. Yes, can I? I'm opening it out for questions. Um, yes, Samuel. Yeah. Um, so um, the way I'm looking at this course, uh, I, mean, I think that there are two big goals for me. So one is uh, definitely understanding my own um, understanding of God's design for marriage, and and uh, you know identifying my own married life and trying to bring that uh, mm -hmm. the way. But definitely the other is where you know, it's more towards my calling, which is um, urban ministry in urban, especially the upcoming youth. So something that I have been, um, I, I mean, I, I try to keep uh, in like with the trends that come, that is in the day. So so everything new like like atheism to homosexuality gender equality all of that so you know these things and but this is what uh, our current generation our future generations are would be struggling like like atheism was unheard of like you know 
when when Christianity started, like polytheism, like people believed everything was a god. But right. but then but from now from there to, we've moved into where we you know atheism is rationally scientifically ex- accepted. I'm sorry, the question is a little bit long. Uh, it's just but the the current literature there's a lot of literature coming in even like books like sapiens by uh, you will know Arihana, which is uh, like it's catching up like almost everybody seems to know its name but you know the modern literature suggests that um, you know when man in its primitive there were just two occupations uh, you're either a hunter or a gatherer so you could either hunt uh, and bring food or you can gather and bring food so so uh, you know we were we were originally hunters and gatherers and uh, the uh, the community that people the people were tribal people moving from one so you 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 reside in a place you hunt and you gather in that once the resources are deplo- depleted you move to another place so as a herd you move right mm-hmm. and and uh, there um, so the way procreation would happen was you know there's no marriage so you know it's just mutual consent and uh, everybody you know like so everybody is kind of sleeping around with everyone and and when children are born it's uh, there's no one single father because no one knows whose child that is so it's it's the communities or the herds responsibility to rear children up so that is where the original you know procreation the format of procreation was so big and and sharing was the principle because like if i kill an elephant and bring it i can't consume it alone i have to share it with the food like with the whole herd so everybody eats my what i have hunted and brought so similarly if i've just gathered one strawberry for the day that will not fill my stomach so i'll, I'll bring it so anyways um uh, but then uh, with the so the modern literature is where with the with the discovery of agriculture so when agriculture when man discovered that you can actually plant and sow and reap and then you can have your own thing you don't have to depend on the herd that's when so so the whole there's a whole new literature opening up and catching up with i think with our generation with the generation to come is that agriculture brought in everything including marriage which is you know now that you can you you can own a piece of land and you can reap and sow uh, and then it doesn't make sense to share it with the whole community uh, so then uh, you know then uh, i'll make sure that uh, you know, i have help so i i find a partner i raise a family and so the land is mine uh, and and whatever is grown in it um is is for my wife and my kids so so then uh, the the culture shifted from a herd culture to um a uh, nuclear, nuclear. Uh, culture yeah so so that so so part of what i'm trying to get from this course is also i i I'll probably you know try to bring this new things that the new teachings that are kind of coming up and 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 i be, and, and i bring this question early on because we are talking about the authorship of marriage and when you're looking it from a uh, uh, you know god's perspective and especially from a christianity and a religious perspective you know when we are um, when we are attributing that god designed marriage makes sense but i'm also at the same time i'm trying to see what arguments um could i present to uh, the coming generation who would believe that you know marriage was discovered by man uh, simply to uh, mm. simply to kind of uh, protect his property and all so just to share mm. some thoughts that i'm having with you. yeah interesting sam Thank you for that. Uh, I, I hope, you know, I, I think, um, please keep this in, uh, in, in mind. And, you know, as we keep progressing, um, you know, we could all think together um, um, and, you know, find some ways of how we can bring this up as points of conversations with uh, people who may not know God at all and give them a, a perspective of this. Right? Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. All right. If we don't have any questions, um, may I request any one of you to pray? And then I will also close in a word of prayer and uh, we can end our class. Anybody? I could. Yes, son, please. Uh, Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time uh, this fellowship this community uh, thank you for your providence thank you for your calling uh, 
and your purpose in our lives that has brought us here. Uh, we are privileged, we are honored uh, to be a part of your family, uh, to know you, God, uh, to have been chosen by you. So we dedicate ourselves, everyone who's in this class, our lecturer, uh, the whole APC Bible faculty, uh, all our semesters. Uh, we thank you, we're grateful, and uh, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to be amongst us, um, guide us in your wisdom, in your truth, um, give us the tools, the understanding that we would need uh, to then take your love, take your grace, uh, and uh, share it with others. Uh, Lord, we commit ourselves to you so that we become vessels of honor, ready for your good work. Thank you again, Father, for everything. Uh, this we ask in the name of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that uh, your word is so filled with good things for us, Lord. Lord, at this time, even as uh, we've begun this journey to know you and your heart for for this institution, Lord, I commit every one of our marriages to your throne of grace. Every student here who's married, everyone who's single and maybe pursuing marriage, or who are going through difficult realities in marriage. Lord, we place this into your hands. Father, you're the one who can bring beauty out of ashes, Lord. You're the one, Lord, who can bring gladness out of our mourning. Lord, you are the one, God, who can bring the best, Lord, out of our least. Lord, and I pray, Master, that you will work on each of our lives and our homes and our families through this course. May we see the power of God work in and through us, Father. May we really see the fruit of your word in our lives, God. May we see, uh, see uh, the, the, our righteous, uh, our tents, Lord, our tents flourishing, our tents being blessed, Lord, that we in our tents will rejoice unto you, Father. Lord, I pray specially God, for those who are hurting in their marriages, Lord. Lord, I pray, God, for your hand of comfort over them. God, give them your word, Lord, your peace, Father. Strengthen them. Hold them by their hand, Father, and show them the way forward with the questions that they may be having. God, that it is your presence, Lord, that brings everything to oneness, Father. Lord, I pray for the young people who are waiting for the right person. Lord, you will open up their eyes to prepare prepare themselves adequately before they make that choice. Lord, we depend on you. You are our sufficiency in all things. We ask all these things in your precious and matchless name. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much. Amen. Just, Amen. just a quick word. Um, there are application quest, uh, questions after each chapter, you know, your learning is going to become more um, stronger and more personal if you were to go through those application questions. So it is there at the back, at the end of chapter one. If you can take some time to do it, if you're married, do it along with your spouse. It will be extremely enriching. Okay. God bless. I will meet you next Wednesday at 10 o'clock. The um, details of our meeting will be up on the stream. Thank you all for connecting. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am.